Thank you, Sue. I've got my, my cup. Have you got your cup there, Lindsay? I've got my <laughs> cup. It has tea in it. It really Fantastic. does. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> now, isn't that interesting? Just, just, just because you've just triggered me there, Sue, talking about textiles, is that uniforms are made of textiles and they are a social construction. They're, they're a, the fact that, that we wear uniforms as they give us a, some kind of identity. So just, just kind of made me think about that at that moment. Um, but we will perhaps might even come back to that later on, you never know. But we are literally just going to have a chat, my friend Lindsay, and we do love chatting to each other and having our tea, which we are now doing to do. <laughs> But I'd like to perhaps tell you a little bit more about ourselves, actually. So I'm going to ask you, Lindsay, tell me, why is creativity important to you? And where does it come from? What, what is your background in crafts in the first place? Well, I'm child number five out of six children. I'm also the first girl. So after four boys, I think my mum was delighted to be able to pass on all her skills and knowledge about all the crafting that she did. Um, she was a very skilled needle woman and she taught me her skills from a very early age. So from as long as I remember, I've been able to knit and I've been able to sew. Um, I hated the classes at school because they just didn't give me that freedom to do the things that my mum taught me to do. And of course, you know, I was always wanting to gallop ahead and they were, no, carry on, you must stick with that waistband until the rest of the class have finished. And I used to find that so frustrating. Um, but it also meant that it made me very self-sufficient. So when I was a teenager and couldn't afford the Laura Ashley fashions that were mm. all over the shops because those dresses were so expensive and you had to go to Chester to Browns to buy them. Um, then McCall's did a Laura Ashley patterns. So yes, I got they a pattern, did. we got mm. the fabric. And I used to make my own clothes um, and that carried right throughout my career, really. And when I had children and when you're um, too busy to, um, I suppose, set aside creativity as something to do, you could actually use it for something like making the children's clothes or making things for the children or making Christmas birthday presents or whatever. And that theme, I suppose, has just carried on. Um, throughout my life and you know as the children left home they each got made a quilt that represented their personality and it was a good way of making friends as well of um, connecting with other people who um, did similar similar crafts so how about you Jenny? Well it's just so interesting to hear your story I and mean, apart from the fact that we are from a similar era Let's talk Laura Ashley there. Oh, no. um, is, that, <laughs> is that actually my dear mum was not a crafty person at all. Um, in fact, she, she really did not like it at all. She did not like doing knitting and sewing, though, though as a child, I know that she did embroidery at school and I've got some pieces that she made because it was the expectation that you learnt how to do that as a woman, I suppose, and um, but she did not enjoy it. It was not her passion in life at all. My father perhaps was a little bit more arty and he did, did a bit of, bit of art, um, but I just picked it up as a, as a, a girl. Do you know, I'm also, I've also got brothers. Um, so, you know, I, I am the only girl of brothers and maybe it was a sense of trying to find a different path of identity. Um, but I certainly used to get things at Christmas to make things and I would have made it by the end of Christmas Day. You know, I did have just got on with it. Um, I'm pretty good at following instructions, I think. But I also, I taught myself to knit and this was the day, days before the internet. So it would have been out of a book you know, turning a page and learning that. Um, and I, I taught myself how to do a bit of, a bit of, um, bit of crochet. And my parents would just have this picture of me sitting on the middle of the floor with bits surrounding me. I am not a, I'm not a tidy 
creative person and I need to have bits around me in order to actually make things. Um, and then like you, I, I did get a little bit of teaching from a friend of my mother's. She decided that perhaps it was a good idea who taught me how to make a skirt when I was about eight and went to brownies and guides and did all the badges, which I know you did as well. Um, and then at school, like you, I did needlework for a bit at school and it was disastrous. I did not enjoy it at all because, again, I felt restricted by, by what was being asked of me. So I did learn to, to make my own clothes. Yeah, Laura Ashley <laughs> in London, <laughs> getting cheap material in those days. Um, it's a lot more expensive these days than it was then mm. back in the 70s, 80s time. And, and yeah, I just went on and carried on to create all sorts of things as I have gone on and then ended up using it in my career. So that's my story, I think. And I guess it's actually, how did we meet? Because you, you were well in the North. I mean, you are a Northern person and I'm a, a deep South person. And how, how did we actually get together over this? Well, I think we had a common, we had something in common in that we used to travel to work on the train and yeah. we were both members of Twitter we were both on Twitter and I think I followed you Probably. and I do remember <laughs> one morning sitting on the train at half past seven in the morning yeah. and seeing a tweet that you had put and your tweet was in response to um, the announcement by the government that more money would be um, put for midwifery technology to reduce the rate of stillbirth and your response was this like what more midwives would be good so of course right in my head I just responded and said next week in class UOB midwifery society we will be knitting midwives please bring wool of your choice I'm going to stop you for a minute because you need to share your screen because I believe you have it available on a powerpoint Ooh. I have I shall put it up. There we go. Okay. Do you want to go back to the original picture as well? Because we did. I've just realised that we've been wittering on already, and we haven't actually <laughs> even got the first the first picture. <laughs> well, should we have should we have the first picture? Let's have the first picture because then everybody can see what we look like. This is us. Yeah. Jenny is, is the one with the wild hair. And yeah. I'm the one in the Dennis the Menace rebellious outfit. And in purple, as you note, in purple. And I'm holding my purple computer, in fact, you know, the colour of my phone case. Mm. And I've got a pinards in my in my other hand. So there you yeah. are. And I think talking about uniform, um, and we'll talk about this a bit more when we look at the knitted midwives, is neither you or I have knitted ourselves in uniform. Absolutely we, not. We have knitted ourselves <laughs> as we see ourselves. Mm. Okay, so so that was us on the train. And then somehow I got a little email from somebody through Twitter that said, hmm, that sounds like a good idea. And then we were <laughs> off. And that was it. That was how Knitted Midwife was born. So we communicated with each other. And we got in touch with the RCM. The conference was coming up. Um, because the RCM at the time was saying um, about the shortage of midwives, it was there in the news. So we took that opportunity because how many times do we go on shift and it's busy and somebody turns around to you and says, well, somebody just knit me a midwife. Um, we've all heard it. We've all heard it. So somehow um, we made that a reality. So, that was how Nissan Midwife was born. Um, at that moment in time, the shortage was 2,600 midwives. But not long after um, we thought of this project, it changed and the shortage was 3,500. So we set ourselves the task of um, getting 3,500 knitted midwives. Um, we advertised through social media and through contacts that we had through the RCM um, to get as many people as we could to 
knit the midwives. And then, of course, Jenny being Jenny said, mm. well, I actually, said, well, <laughs> well, well, actually, do you think we ought to actually research this in some way? Um, what sort of response are we going to get from the delegates? And, and we could actually do a little bit of a questionnaire and find out what people think about what it is that they are making. And Lindsay said, yes, OK. So I then got ethics a few approval for us to do so and, and the RCM were very kind to it to allow us to actually um, give questionnaires out to the people who were present who at the conference in order to um, to find out some information from them about what their responses are were to seeing the display and to be quite honest with you it, it the responses that we got were pretty powerful mm -hmm. Um, and we have written it up and we, we are in a place of at moment trying to find a place to, to get it published because it sort of falls between different stools, but I perhaps won't go into that too much at the moment, but, but it's an interesting exercise in itself trying to get something like this published. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to say anything more about that? Your experience of actually running the, the, the actual um, event? It was amazing is really a, a good summary of it. Um, we had a very short time scale because I recall that we started this project around about the May and then um, the conference was in October. So we had a very short time scale for getting these knitted midwives, but midwives, they listened to the call and they responded. So we ended up with 502 knitted midwives to display at the conference. And if you can imagine the fun we had um, getting them all laid out, like you can see on the screen. But what you will notice is there's a big sort of playpen at the side. And what that represents, that playpen, although it's got midwives, you know, hanging onto the outside and climbing up and jumping out, um, in that um, playpen is wool, and that is the unknitted midwives. So inside that basket, there are 3,000 balls of wool. Um, I managed to get them from a local charity shop near where I live, and um, they were having um, a wool uh, amnesty at the time, and they very, very kindly um, let mm. me have the, the balls of wool. So although we've got 500 and two midwives all displayed there um, in the basket of the unknitted ones and then very proudly on the top is our um, own lovely Leslie Page with her her medallion and um, looking very glamorous at the time. It's when she was president at the time she was president she was. of the Royal College of Midwives and she sat she, on the top. She was and she, she has her doll I'm sure um, but if you have a look at them all, they're all different. Mm. Like midwives are mm. all different. And going back to this, you know, thing about uniform, then many of these midwives are knitted sort of with some form of identity. And for many of them, you would have like an old fashioned called the midwife uniform or there was new uniforms there's some in scrubs there's some holding babies there's some with stethoscopes there's every variety of midwife representing all parts of the community um, represented in that display and my goodness they just looked wonderful they they really mm. did I think Jenny you were sorry to be there weren't you not, not to, to be, be there, there. not yeah. to be there yeah it was yeah. very difficult not to be there but yeah, it, it was it was just wonderful to see how people had contributed. Um, mm. There's also one or two male midwives. Got to remember that yeah. that they were there too. There were yeah. a few there, weren't there? Yeah. yeah, I think there's a few on the front row that you yeah. can't see. And there's midwives there that you'll know as well. Um, yes. Yeah, if you look closely at one of the pictures, you will see some midwives you know. And of course, Jenny and I are in there holding the fort. Uh, somewhere I think we're somewhere in the middle <laughs> somewhere yeah <laughs> but we yeah. we also asked them didn't we to 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 um, send in with the dolls themselves actually why they'd made it um, and we didn't get them for all of them but the illustration there shows 
actually one of the, the messages that was sent in particularly um, straight to Mr. Hunt mm. of why she was so, why she'd made it. So being so proud of her daughter who worked as a case loading midwife. Mm. And we had an, so many of those little messages, didn't we, that oh, were they, very poignant. Yeah. I mean, I, I can remember going into my manager at the time, virtually sobbing at some of the stories because they were just so poignant. There was, you know, stories from mothers, from grandmothers, from aunts, mm. from women who'd had babies. They were from sisters. They were from midwives. Um, you know, they, they came from everywhere. The, the furthest afield came from New Zealand. We had quite a lot come from Germany. Um, we had some from Denmark, I think another one from Spain, and they all came with stories, you know, there were women who'd lost babies, it was just, you know, incredible, and when we get down to um, having a look at that data, Jenny, I think it's going to be really interesting in mm. in seeing what, um, you know, looking at those stories again, and, yeah. and looking at the themes, Absolutely. but I think, yeah, one of the things is these these midwives have personalities, Mm -hmm. And we gave them personalities as well. I mean, I think I'm hoping it's the next slide. I mean, you know, there is a positive deviant. <laughs> you know, somehow, Leslie Page escaped and was sliding down the banister. And of course, we had to take a photo. Um, and there were, you know, there were lots of stories that came from midwives about, you know, the character of the midwife that they'd created. So I don't know if you want to talk about the, the next slide, Jenny, because this mm. is quite a powerful, yeah, powerful midwife. Yeah, I mean, this, this one actually had no mouth. Um, and what we signified from that really is, again, this midwife who, who has no voice. And some of the messages that actually came through from the questionnaire was... That, that midwives were feeling so frustrated because they, they felt that they had no political voice mm. being able to speak out and to, to say what was really going on in their, in their practice. Mm. So seeing this one, which didn't, didn't, have, um, didn't have a mouth, was, was quite significant to us. And obviously this one was also crocheted rather than knitted, and that was fine as well. But mm. did, did you want to add anything more to that? No, I mean, I think the main, one of the main themes that came from the survey was about this having a voice or not having a voice. And it was almost like the knitted midwives were speaking for them. And, you know, the, the knitted midwives were used as a medium for being able to express, like you say, the frustration um, and other thoughts they had about you know this this midwifery shortage but another thing that was interesting was there was a couple of comments on a couple of the questionnaires mm. that were completely the opposite it was about yeah. what are you doing you know this is childish this um you know what how can you do this it, it looks so unprofessional and I just wonder um where that came from and why that mm. was said. I mean, we've discussed this a lot, haven't we, Jenny? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, 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 I mean, the message felt very strongly that, that they felt that we were, we were putting midwifery back millions of years because actually we should be sort of stepping forward into a research-based kind of professional kind of world. Mm. Um, but actually this is research. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different different type of approach and and the responses to that display um pr produced an emotional response from people mm. and that that's again what we have found from the qualitative um responses to to the questionnaire itself mm. that it actually stimulated something very powerful in people to see that number of um even that was only 500 midwives mm. there that the realization actually this is this many that that is missing from our profession mm. at the moment and it was it was a very powerful powerful response that we got mm. so jenny does your creativity influence your teaching and activities with student midwives um yes <laughs> 
Ow. I think <laughs> <laughs> there you are. I've answered that one. No, I. <laughs> it has because I, my understanding again, again of what I've just said that the emotive response that we got from people from even even just looking at and and participating within this activity shows that actually how art and um, using creative activities can unlock professional conversations it can unlock something a lot deeper than if you were just having a conversation just like you and me I mean we can go back in history and think of sewing bees now you know in the in the in the um and which is still taking place but in the old days in America where they created um a quilt for somebody who was getting married in the local village then all the women would come together and sit round and make the quilt together, that the con- it would trigger the conversations between them. And, mm-hmm. and this is the same with creative activities that we do in teaching and learning. And I have been using it in many different ways relating to spirituality, in understanding the art of midwifery practice, um, in, in getting students to think about um, using, using dramatic ways of doing, for example, I've, I've um, taught or facilitated learning about the menstrual cycle by getting students to get out of their chairs and be part of that menstrual cycle um, holding balloons I can't see what I'm doing but holding balloons as being the, the ovum and, and things like that and and it, it kind of helps them to to think about things in a different way I mean some of them don't particularly like it they think Oh, no, this isn't for me, but actually it does stimulate discussion, et cetera, afterwards. And then I've carried on to, to use it in research as well. So, um, and yourself, have you, have, what about you? Have you been using it within your teaching? I have. Um, I, what I find is that students all have very different um, backgrounds and experiences and you know for some of them using creative means is a way of um, using skills they already have in I suppose an unknown environment and being able to express ideas and thoughts in a way um, that they maybe haven't thought of before. It's not always successful when I first started out um, we as a, as a lecturer um, I facilitated a session where students made a placenta and it started off really well and all the stuff was all over the place a bit like you were describing Um, and then the fire alarm went off right in the middle and we had to evacuate and we were out of the classroom for probably I don't know half an hour might have even been a bit longer so when we came back there was 20 minutes to make a placenta clear up and clear the room so it wasn't entirely successful but um it was a good learning experience about you know placentas and there were some amazing uh, placentas produced um but also I incorporate amateur dramatics as well um, mm-hmm. in some of my teaching as well, because I do, I do that as well um, as an aside. So there are so many different creativities that we can mm-hmm. use in the classroom that enables students to, um, you know, deepen their learning and also that thought process. And I was just thinking about what you just said about um, about textiles. There's something about textiles that, you have to take your time and sometimes you've no idea what is going to come out of it at the end so it's almost like weaving those stories Mm. you know you start off with one thing and that thought process carries on and then you end up with something completely different and you can Mm. go back to it um you know like for example you know looking at at um you know this midwife with no mouth we've now identified that she was crocheted and I don't think we'd really thought about that before had we because Mm. you know it was just a midwife with with no mouth Mm. that's just a a different way of doing it Mm. isn't it yeah 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 Yeah. and and what about um oh I was just (laughs) I was just gonna say you you remind me of of um, when you're talking about your placenta story about when I used to, to do sessions on spirituality, I, 
I did use glitter sometimes and have have glitter that was was uh, part of it. And uh, one one day um, I had must have had a hole in my bag because I had to walk back to my office ca- carrying these back the, the, the creative things that had been left over, whatever. And I realized there was a whole trail of glitter that I'd left down the corridor. I rise up. <clears throat> yes, anyway, I wasn't particularly popular after doing that, but there you are, these, these things happen. So, oh. But I think midwife lecturers particularly are, mm. are creative people. Mm. And when we moved into universities from way back when, before, um, you know, before we actually got degree programs and moved into university. I think when, when midwives stepped into university, they felt they had to take on the university way of teaching. They had to, to start doing lectures. And this was even before the days of PowerPoint, everybody. We're that old. Mm. But, but actually, you know, they had, to, they had to learn new skills within a university setting to make it look as though we were a degree program. And, and so a lot of people stepped back from using creative methods at that time because they felt that it wasn't appropriate or they felt that the university wouldn't accept it. And then it seemed to have, have, have picked up again. And it's very heartening to hear midwife lecturers out there who are mm-hmm. using creative methods a lot now. And I, I think it's, it's wonderful to hear that, that that's happening because it does help students to learn in a different way. Mm-hmm. So let's think about research as well. I'm running a little bit out of time here, I think. But anyway, let's get on to research and think about that. And, and I, I used creative methods in my, um, my doctoral work. It, it was um, education doctorate. Oh, you're going backwards. Oh, look. Yes. So See, I've put as, it in the right place. You did put it in the right place. <laughs> so that, that is a quilt that I made as part of my doctoral study. I mean, there are other methods that I used within the, um, within the study because it was in a bricolage. So anybody who wants to go and look that up about research methods and think about bricolage and what that means. It's like a patchwork. Aha. Here we go. Um, but I also, there, there are other methods that I use, such as photo elicitation. So if you want to go and look that one up as well. And I also made um, quilts for each of the, the participants, participants in the study, but they were quilts that were made with um, a PowerPoint as opposed to the quilt, the textile quilt, which is my reflective part of my study. So each one of those squares represents one entry into my research diary for the five years, uh, four to five mm-hmm. years that I was doing my study. So that's what that is. And, and it's pretty um, special to me because it is, it is my, my life over the past, not past, but during that time I was doing my education study. And there is actually a website where you can look it all up. So what about you from a research perspective where where are you going with yours what are you doing well, with craft I'm quite early in my doctoral research in that I'm just about to submit my proposal um, so in view of the pandemic and other things I know that I'm going to be using felting and I have produced two squares in preparation but I think once my research gets underway then um, I will be using that as a f- reflective process, probably in a similar way to how you mm. have, but I'll be using felting, which I suppose brings us on to another little idea you had when we met at a conference last oh year. Oh dear, yes, that's and me. And you got me into trouble again. <laughs> I shall move the slides on while you explain. <laughs> well, yes, we had last year was meant to be the year of the nurse and the midwife. And I felt that we needed to have some kind of celebration of it in some way that was not not just a celebration, but to inspire people to make um, a, a, a patchwork for themselves of nine different squares. Um, we decided we wanted to do it over a period of nine months because it seemed appropriate. And also actually, if you've got nine squares, then you can very easily have a cushion cover 
or have a hanger, um, a hanging patchwork that you can have at the end of it as a celebration of the year of the nurse and the midwife. And we started on this project in February last year. We launched it, I think, in February last year. And then something called a pandemic appeared. And it, it kind of threw a bit of a spanner in the works. I, there, I know that there are some people out there who have participated and made their patchworks already. Um, and I, cause I have seen them and I have seen some amazing work that other people mm. have been doing. For others, and including ourselves, I think, mm. it has been more tricky to start mm. getting, to get going with it. I've made four squares now and you have made two. Mm. In fact, I've made five, but it's, it's not there yet. But it has been intensely a slow process. The idea was to do one each month as a reflection of that month in relation to midwifery practice. And I've had a, had, had a diary and I've drawn sketches for each of the months, but actually the making of it has become quite difficult. Mm. And it's, it's something to do with this pandemic has had an effect. Mm. Um, and now looking at the, those squares that we have there, the, the two, there are two there that actually are quite similar, aren't they? Mm. so do you want to just say what what yes. happened there yeah because we did these completely independently um mm. we didn't ever discuss any of the squares they just sort of appeared on the blog and there they were and I was just in the process of, of doing mine when yours appeared on the blog and I looked at it and I could not believe my eyes because it was mm. so similar to mine and and talking about you know, the difficulty of producing them. I think the pandemic has brought up difficult stuff. Mm. And for me, I mean, you, you can have a look at the blog and read it. I won't um, go into it in great detail, but the, the one that I did, you know, represents my daughter. I mean, it could represent anybody, which is why it doesn't have a face because, you know, you put your own, Person. This is this is the one down on the bottom right hand corner on the screen, yeah, isn't it? That's this one. one. Yeah, whether, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but it's it's that one. And by the time I'd finished it, I was absolutely wrung out just with the mm. um because you know, as I was saying before about weaving a story, every stitch in that meant something. And my daughter is an army nurse, and I suppose, you know, when you think army, you think um you know people going into battle and you know you think that's what parents worry about but I've never worried about Katie being a nurse because um you know she's she's likely to be looking after people who are unwell in critical care not actually in the middle of a battle but then doing that I suddenly realized well there's a virus it could be that virus mm. that and it was difficult stuff to process, very difficult. Mm. And I think that's why, I, found, I mean, I've got the ideas for the other ones. Um, they're there in my head and I will do them. But um, it, it's been hard and I think it's been hard for everybody. And I think the thing about crafting and creativity is that emotional connection. Because mm. while you're doing the work, <clears throat> you're processing those difficult emotions or, you know, there might not be difficult emotions, but you are still going through that process and it, it can be tricky. And I think we talked about that, didn't we, um, yeah. Jenny? Mm. Yeah, because I actually, the, you know, over this pandemic, people have experienced difficulties with, mm. with their mental well-being. And I'm, I'm mm. very conscious of, of midwives in, out there who've been holding, mm. holding this space, holding this inside. Mm. And I think there will be, more need for people to respond to this in a um to the pandemic mm -hmm. and to get some help to respond to it um and maybe art therapy or may, maybe creative therapy will be a positive thing for some people and may, maybe mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. um so i i think i think it's it's been a tricky time but there is still time for you to get involved if you feel that you'd like to make your own um patchwork to celebrate being a midwife over this time, then 
please come and join us and and do do make make something and you can read everything about it on the um the wordpress that that we have made um and we've been writing our own blogs which sort of it reflects on why we've made things mm. because it's not just i've made this it is about actually why why is it that it, that we chose these colors why why is it that did we choose these particular images to think of and of course the black one that is the bottom left hand corner was was the month actually when um george floyd died um shocking absolutely shocking and which is why i've got the black lives matter um mm. hashtag there but but at the same time about the issues around maternal deaths for women who are black and asian um and and that's why i've got the the five times more hashtag there for that particular situation because that month it happened all at the same time and it was just raw felt very raw and i couldn't do much more than but just present it like that so so that's why that's there so if you do want to get involved please please come and join us and and have a look at the website and ask us any questions and maybe by the icm we in june we will have something that is complete that we might be able to share as part of it so better crack on yeah. then better crack on <laughs> i think Don't think yeah where are we april hmm could be, be, could right. be tricky be right <laughs> I think also yeah, this next year. <laughs> as well, Jenny, is that the thing about crafting and creativity, there's no right and there's no wrong. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you can yeah. a stitch can cover a multitude of sins, I have discovered, um, yeah. when you're making things, <laughs> particularly when you're felting, because I make all sorts of errors and I just cover it up with another colour. Who's to know? And it's about your interpretation and about how you feel about it and your connection with that piece of work. So there is no right, there is no wrong. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.